Hi, welcome to the ninth lecture of Triple E 107. In this lecture, we'll be deviating from analog systems and we'll be transitioning to digital systems. And recall that there are two types of uh, modulation carriers, your continuous wave sine, uh, sine waves, your continuous wave sine waves, and your rectangular pulses. And using rectangular pulses as carriers of information uh, gives rise to digital signals. And uh, in this lecture, we'll be talking about their properties and how the how they are uh, or uh, how they are how they uh, behave uh, in the frequency domain. Ooh, okay. All right. So these are the types of modulation: continuous wave and a pulse modulation. For a pulse modulation, we have an analog pulse modulation and a digital pulse modulation. The analog pulse modulation is also similar to that of your continuous wave modulation where you modulate the amplitude, the phase, or the width, or the frequency of your pulse. Okay? So it's uh, similar to this right here. If you vary the width of the pulse, you're varying or varying its frequency, the position of the pulse, you vary the where it starts, and you also vary the amplitude. Okay. So, why do we use pulse modulation? The good thing about pulses is that it's off most of the time. Thus, your transmit power is generally lower than that of your continuous wave transmission. Your users can schedule where, when they can transmit, so if you're going to use pulses, then maybe, not maybe, if you transmit every TS, okay, other users can use the channel and insert their own transmissions such that you, can, you won't be overlapping with different users. Okay? And this is one advantage of pulse modulation schemes. And this is uh, the necessary transition from your analog modulation schemes to your digital modulation schemes. A disadvantage is that it requires a larger transmission bandwidth compared to the message signal. Okay. So before we go there, let's review how sampling works. Consider an arbitrary signal M of T sampled at a uniform rate 1 over of s. So your sampled message can now be represented based on that. Your message signal will be multiplied by what we call a pulse train. Okay. It is a periodic signal at which you have an impulse every t sub s seconds. So this is the period of your signal. And if you multiply this signal to your message signal, you'll be left with a series of impulse uh, impulse functions that has a varying amplitude based on the value of the message signal at that certain time. So it is represented by this equation right here. So you have a series of impulse responses with different amplitudes, with different values, with different areas based on your message signal. Every T sub S seconds. And you do that from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay? So since your impulse train, sorry, it's not the pulse train, sorry, impulse train, the since it's periodic, you can get the <clears throat> you can get the uh, Fourier series of that. If you try to get the Fourier series of that, since this is a delta function uh, using the sifting property, the uh, C sub k that you'll get here, the Fourier coefficient, is equal to 1 over T sub s for all values of k. Right? Basically, the Fourier transform of an impulse train is itself. Right? And if we use the coefficients, According to the synthesis equation, the uh, the frequency domain equivalent of an impulse train is itself. 
and it re repeats itself every 1 over ts or basically every sampling uh, every fs which is your sampling frequency okay so since you have a point wise multiplication in the time domain you multiply two signals in the time domain you have, the effect of that in a frequency domain will be a convolution if your message signal has this spectrum right by defined by m of f you will convolve that with an impulse string okay if you're go going to convolve that with impulse strings by using the sifting property of your uh, impulse response you will see that your message signal will have replicas in every 1 over t sub s uh, every 1 over t sub s spacing in the frequency domain these replicas are actually your aliases and this is present in every digital signal okay so it is important then to select a spacing 1 over t sub s such that the, the aliases won't overlap with each other okay so uh, before we go there, uh, we can recover our sampled signal by filtering out the aliases at the output. So from your digital sampled signal, we can get an analog signal. Okay? If we uh, use a low-pass filter, we get our original signal. We recover our original signal. Okay. So we use... A, uh, a an ideal low pass filter for that which has an impulse response equal to this and using that impulse response of your low pass filter which is equal to a sync function okay which is equal to a sync function by convolving that with the sampled uh, with the uh, sampled version of your message signal you get this reconstruction formula right, which was discussed in the first parts of Tripoli 35 okay if we have a 1 over ts that is not enough it won't make create enough spacing between your uh, aliases okay what happens is that you won't be able to recover your original signal because it will now be distorted by its aliases. So if you try to recover that using a low-pass filter, you get this spectrum right here. Oops. So this is the spectrum that you'll get using a low-pass filter. And this is not the same spectrum as your original message frequency. This will now be a distorted version and you cannot recover from this distortion that's why we uh, have a minimum sampling rate depending on the highest frequency content of your signal right so conditions for a successful sampling are outlined as follows the message should be band limited okay for some bandwidth w and your sampling frequency must be at least twice the message bandwidth Okay, so the minimum uh, sampling frequency is called the Nyquist rate. So, okay, consider an arbitrary signal where you have a sinusoid exactly at W. If you sample that at the Nyquist rate, the sinusoidal component will have aliases that overlap at the edges of your bandwidth. And this is already an irrecoverable irrecoverable signal so the overlap can add, add constructively or destructively depending on the sampler and uh, if you want to recover these uh, sinusoid the, these sinusoid uh, signals then you need to space your uh, aliases such that they are far away enough from each other such that there is no overlap between them So to recover our sampled signals, we need to sample them at a rate much higher than the Nyquist rate. So 
Also, in practice, the message is not band limited. So, we often place a so-called anti-aliasing filter before we sample the signal. In practice, your ideal LPF is not physically realizable, so we are required to sample more than the Nyquist rate. So, instead, we place the aliases far enough such that we can use a practical low-pass filter. We use a practical low-pass filter, this will be eliminated, this will be eliminated, we can recover the original signal. Okay? Another problem with uh, the sampling process is that we use a series of impulses. But in reality, we cannot create an impulse train. We, neither even we can create, we cannot create an impulse function in the first place. So instead of an impulse function, maybe we can use a pulse train, a rectangular pulse train to be exact. So by you by doing the same process as the previous sampling uh, using the impulse train, where you multiply your impulse train with the signal, we can use the same method for your rectangular pulse train, where you multiply the rectangular pulses to your original signal, x of t, and this is called natural sampling. So we create this signal right here, naturally sampled signal, and we can insert another sampled signal in between. So in effect, the same two users can, can use the same bandwidth without interfering with one another. Okay? So how do we analyze the spectrum of a naturally sampled signal using your pulse string? Let P of T be the rectangular pulse. The sampled signal is equal to your message sing signal times the pulse train, where you have uh, the summation of the different time-shifted versions of each rectangular pulse. Okay? So the pulse train is periodic. We can solve for its Fourier series. The Fourier series can be solved in this way. So we already know the Fourier series of a rectangular pulse train. It's uh, equal to the sync function. So the frequency domain will be described by its uh, by its envelope, basically. So what happens when you multiply this m of t with the pulse train? You convolve the message spectrum to the different coefficients of your pulse train. So instead of having aliases with the same height as the original message at the middle, the other aliases will be scaled depending on the coefficient at that frequency. And take note that the spacing between them is still 1 over T sub S, where T sub S is the sampling period of your pulse train. Right? The height of all these will be dependent on the envelope okay, of the Fourier transform of your pulse. Okay? And this does not just apply to a rectangular pulse train. You can have any arbitrary pulse, P of T. Your message aliases outside the bandpass region will be scaled depending on the frequency transform of this pulse. The Fourier transform, rather, of this pulse. And we can still recover the signal in the same way of how we uh, how we recover the original uh, the pulse train, where you use a bandpass filter to extract the original signal. Okay. So, however, uh, since we're using pulses, as you can see here, you use a large larger bandwidth in transmitting the signal. Okay. And that's the end of the first part of this lecture. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. Thank you for listening. See you next meeting.